Hello everyone, what is the crack? So, it's Bernard Nulty here from Living to Learn. So I'm out and about, filming, for my first in a little mini-series, which I mentioned I was going to do before Christmas, trying to up my game on plants, trees, fungi, and all things nature. So, basically, I'm going to wander around, film whatever I find that's interesting, talk about it a little, take you guys along with me. So, let's go and have a wander. These little fellas provide some of the first colour in the winter woods. This is the Scarlet Elf Cup or Sarcocypha Coconea. So you'll find these guys growing in damp woods from early spring to about May. Growing on stumps and dead branches close to the forest floor. So when these guys are young, they're little uh, pink balls basically. And they open up into the cup shape. And when they're fully formed, they're about 3 to 5 centimetres in diameter. And the stem or stipe is generally white or off-white. It's about an inch high, if it's visible at all. Unlike the typical idea of a mushroom, the spores of the Sarcocyphaceae family, that's a mouthful, are held in small needle-like structures called ascae, or asca as a singular, which fire out the spores when you come in contact with things like dogs or small animals, things like this. Apparently you can actually hear a, an audible hiss from it when it releases its spores. You'd have to be pretty damn close, I'd imagine. It's like almost all fungi. The Sarcocypha coconea has a pretty almost identical lookalike, the Sarcocypha australica. Now they share pretty much all the same characteristics and are really, really easily confused. You'd need a microscope to tell the difference generally between them. Edibility is debatable. I've seen in some sources, some say that it's edible, in fact it's delicious. Others say that it's unpalatable and others say that it's completely inedible. It's leathery enough, so I can imagine it would be pretty unpalatable. In terms of its medicinal value, there's not a whole lot of information out there. I've read a few places that Indian tribes have used them in the past to cover up freshly cut umbilical cords from the, ch from the kids. That's about it. I don't know if there's any medicinal value to it. Fun fact though, scarlet elf cups contain lectins. Lectin is a sugar binding protein that is used in biomedical science for blood testing and blood typing. Trimetes versicolor, the turkey tail. It's a member of the polypore family. Now these guys grow all year round in deciduous forests, generally on dead or diseased or dying hardwood. They're highly variable in colours. They go from beige to orange, from dark grey to purple, hence the versicolor. So when fully grown, they vary in size between 1 to 4 inches. They generally grow in large groups and generally of the same colour in each group. Uh, they're wavy and crescent shaped at the cap, and hence the turkey tail, the fan shape. Um, they feel thin and stiff and kind of leathery to the touch. One of the key identifying features of turkey tails is the pores on the underside. And you can tell the difference between varying species and subspecies of trametes by identifying the amount of, spo of pores per square centimetre. Turkey tails are edible. Taste is up for discussion. Some people seem to love them, other people just don't seem to like them at all. Other people just throw them in as filler and soups and things like that. But it's as a medicinal that turkey tails really come to the fore. Turkey tails are an immuno-boosting superpower. Turkey tails contain polysaccharide K, or PSK, which has been used in the treatment of stomach cancers during chemotherapy to boost immune systems. It has been used during the treatment of other cancers, although its effectiveness is still up for debate. All in all, it's pretty useful, edible and medicinal. There is, however, a lookalike. This lookalike won't kill you, but it's an easy mistake to make. This is the false turkey tail, the sterum ostrae. Ostrae meaning oyster. It looks very similar to the turkey tail in its where it grows, its habitat, its shape. There's one key difference, easy ID. When you turn it over, you see that the underside of the false turkey tail 
has no pores it's smooth to the touch actually leathery kind of like the top of it whereas the turkey tail has pores a clear porous surface like i said it's not poisonous but it is inedible and um, an easy mistake to make so watch out for it This random pile of feces, I'm pretty sure is red deer scat. I'm gonna guess that it's red deer based on the size and the shape of the droppings and probably that it's female. One of the key identifying features of red deer scat is the little donut shaped indentation on the pebbles. You can generally tell what the deer have been eaten by the pebbles. Uh, if it's in clumps like this, it's young leaves twigs and roots if it was more clumpy a little bit uh, softer it would probably be grasses shoots and fruits a word of caution though before you go messing with deer scat and trying to figure out what i had for breakfast uh, deer scat can contain e coli and in some cases pretty rare though mad cow disease also where there's deer there's generally ticks and where there's ticks there's generally the risk of lyme disease so check your crevices people Now this, this is an interesting one and it perfectly summarises the challenge of trying to ID fungi, particularly when they're old. This could be, and it's my best guess, the velvet shank or Flamulina velutypes. Flamulina meaning orangey and velutypes meaning velvet legs. It's a winter grown fungus and can withstand frost and ice and can be frozen and still survive. They typically grow on ash, beech and other hardwoods. Young velvet shanks have a bright orange waxy cap between 1 and 3 inches in diameter and can go up to 4 inches when fully grown. The stipe is darker closer to the base and gets brighter towards the cap. The gills are wide and are barely connected to each other. Adnate. As the flamulina ages, the edges tend to lose their colour and the stipe darkens towards a brownie black colour. Velvet shanks are edible, which is a bit of a rarity amongst winter fungi. Medicinally, the Chinese also regard the velvet shank for its anti-cancer properties. However, I'd take Chinese medicine with a pinch of salt. All the signs point to this being an old velvet shank, but given that we had a mild winter, there is an outside chance that this could be a toxic lookalike. The Gallerina marginata, the funeral bell fungus. Like the velvet shank, it is known to grow on beach but mostly grows on coniferous woods and not really at this time of year. It's similar in colour and shape. The funeral bell fungus is however smaller, uh, rarely larger than two inches in diameter and grows in tighter clusters. The gill structure is similar, but the colour is different. Velvet shank gills are porcelain off-white colour and the gallerina is a whitish brown. The stipes can both be pretty similar, both purplish brown colour. Gallerina, however, commonly has an annulus or it's kind of like a skirt uh, on the stipe and it's a remnant of the partial veil although rain and wind can take that off so it's not always an ID feature. Gallerina contains similar compounds to the deck cap, amatoxins. And as such, Gallerina is a bad boy fungus. 
Amatoxins inhibit RNA, ribonucleic acid, which copies DNA and sends genetic messages throughout the body. The toxins build up in the liver and kidneys, causing failure in both, and if not rapidly treated, painful and slow death in a matter of days. The Gallerina marginata grows up from August until November. However, the mild winter may have left some hangover, so it's one to watch out for. One key way to tell the difference, and it's one I wish I had done at the time, is the spore print. Flamulina generally has white spore print, whereas the Gallerina marginata has a browny orange one, and that will pretty much give you a definitive answer as to which one it is. This looks like Lycopidum like palatum, the common puffball. I'm going to try and find another one and show you why they get the puffball name. So this looks like another form of puffball. Um, Calvatia gigante, I guess. I'm not really sure. Uh, I'll go into puffballs in more detail when they're in season. But uh, what happens to puffballs when they get to the end of their life is they enter a spore dispersal stage so the inside changes from white to a sort of powdery brown when I cut into it you can see that it's kind of dusty there's a spore cloud that puffs out hence the puffball name so a word of warning when you're messing with these though be careful because if you do uh, inhale too much of this you can give yourself a uh, a pulmonary infection called lycopodinosis. So if you're going to mess with it, just mess with it from a distance. So I've just felt a few spits of rain and my car is 40 minutes away. I have no idea if this camera is waterproof, so I ain't chancing it. So this is probably a good time to end this episode. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and I hope you learned something. I know the camera works a little bit shaky, and the descriptions probably leave a lot to be desired, but I hope the principle is right, and I hope it's something that you guys would enjoy to watch in the future. I hope to put this stuff out maybe once, once a month, hopefully twice a month, and uh, try to chronicle stuff as it goes through the summer and onto the winter. Uh, I'm going to try and cover trees, plants, fungi, like I said, anything that's in of interest. So if you guys have any feedback, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Bear in mind though that this is my first crack at it, so be gentle. Anyway, uh, thanks very much for watching, and as they say in Canada, PEACE OUT! Hey everyone, so I hope you enjoyed the video. I was just thinking about this, and I was going to post it last week, and I kind of decided it's not really a living to learn video if I don't talk about what I learned while making the video. So I'm just going to waffle on for two or three minutes about the stuff I learned, the mistakes I made and the things I'm going to fix for the next one. So first and foremost, video editing is hard. It's a pain in the arse basically, it's a pain in the arse. It takes a long time to do and I only realised that voicing over which I did for some of the stuff is really hard as well really hard to get personality across so I hope that I hope that it it was an enjoyable video and I hope that you guys will understand that this is my first crack at it and I'll get better as things go along but in terms of skills and knowledge the the things I learned really were I made some fairly rookie errors when I was out and about I didn't take the time to really look at what was around, what was going on. So there were certain things like I didn't take note of what the fungi was growing on, or the type of ground it was, or what trees were overhead, stuff like that. I was having to then rely on the video that I'd gotten to try and help with the ID, or if I'd ID it on the fly, I was having to try and figure out was I right or wrong, and. While that, while that's, while it, while it worked out for me this time because some of them were quite easy to ID, you saw with the, the velvet shank, I couldn't make a clear decision as to what it was. Now I'm 99% sure that's what it is, but 
had I have taken the time to really, really think about it, I could have taken spore prints, I could have taken samples home. That's all stuff that I didn't do because I was too focused on trying to get half decent shots and just get home, make the video. So that's a mistake I don't intend on making again. I intend on being a little bit more in depth. There's also something that I thought about and I kind of, with plants and trees and fungi and things like this, I kind of would liken it to to tracking in a lot of ways. And I only really thought about this after, while I was editing the video. When you're tracking things, I, 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 like, I like learning how to track and stuff, and when you're tracking things, you need to not just look at the print. You need to look at the area around and get the whole picture in so that you can get a, get a mental image of what the animal you're tracking was doing, not just, oh well that's a footprint. You, you can kind of see, well this is the way they moved, this is uh, what they were doing at the time. And I think with fungi, it's that's something that I should have done. I should have taken in the wider picture and I'd say from now on that's one thing I intend to do. And uh, yeah, so finally, thanks very much for watching. Uh, I intend to push out one of these a month. They're going to be part of a series. It's not always going to be fungi, like I said. It's going to be trees, plants. Uh, could be more deer poop. Could be, I don't know what it's going to be. But it really just depends on what I see on the day, what's interesting. As you know yourself, and uh, yourselves, it can be pretty hard to get time to get out and about. So... I'm kind of limited to what is in my area and what's there at the time I get out. I don't get the opportunity to go out, especially now in the winter when it's dark in the evenings. I'm home and it's dark, so I don't get the opportunity to go out that often. So I have to make the most of it and film what's there and try and talk about what's there. So, look, I hope you guys enjoyed it and uh, I'll keep you posted on when the next one's coming. Should be two, three weeks from now, hopefully. And uh, I'll be making videos. I, in the meantime, smaller videos, little demos or reviews and things like this. So thanks very much for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And uh, I'll see you on the next one. Peace!